Good morning, everybody, and welcome um, to the uh, Board of Adjustment hearing of February 16th, um, 2023. Our, um, our fearless uh, leader and, and vice chair are um, not here today, so we need to elect somebody to um, run the meeting. I would like to nominate Jeff Schwartz. And I support that nomination. Thanks for putting me in the hot seat, guys. <laughs> Do we need a roll call for that? Okay. All right. Great. Um, <clears throat> so, um, Chairman Loper, Vice Chair Person, Member Ward, present. Member Cardin, present. Member Schwartz, present. Chairman, we have a quorum. Um, so let's move to the minutes. Um, the minutes from December 15th, uh, 2022, January 19th, 2023. Are there any comments from the board members? Um, um, no, if, since there's no comments, they're deemed approved. Um, so we can move to the next to the slides. Um, this meeting has been noticed in accordance with the open meeting law, ARS 38-431. Agendas are available within 24 hours of each meeting in the Maricopa County Planning and Development Office and are also available on the Planning and Development website one week prior to the hearing at www.maricopa.gov slash planning. With respect to the hearing process, cases will be considered in the order they appear on the agenda unless otherwise agreed to by the board. For each case, the applicant will be given a set amount of time to present their testimony. Any witnesses wishing to give testimony on a particular case shall notify the board of such interest. This shall be done by filling out a speaker's card for in-person attendance or registering desire to, com to comment as noted on the published agenda. Also, at the appropriate time for each case, the chairman will ask those attending in person and online who wish to speak to a case, raise their hand by clicking on the icon on the webinar screen. Staff will provide the chairman with the names of the persons who have registered and note a desire to comment and those registered participants who have raised their hand. The chairman will call on each named participant one at a time such testimony will be limited to a maximum of three minutes. However, the actual amount of time allowed to testimony shall be at the discretion of the board chair. The chairman will conduct the hybrid in-person and virtual public hearing according to the bylaws and according to the rules established by the chairman regarding public comment. Votes will be done by roll call votes only. Um, so, um, <clears throat> um, so we can move to um, the agenda. Um, there's one withdrawal. It's uh, case number one, TU. 2022041. This case was a temporary use permit for underage occupancy in the senior citizen overlay in Sun City. It's been withdrawn by the applicant. No action is necessary. Great. Thank you. Um, so let's move to the regular agenda. Um, case BA2022061. If we can get a presentation from staff. Uh, Chairman Schwartz and members of the board, agenda item number two is for subject case BA 2022-061. Uh, it's a variance request for an RU43 zone property located at 21816 West Lone Mountain Road in the Whitman area in Supervisory District 4. As written in the staff report, approving this request would have the effect of allowing for a 19-foot side setback in the north of the parcel, where 30 feet is the minimum permitted. Next slide, please. The subject lot was created as part of an unregulated minor land division in 2006 and is one of several properties that the applicant and his family own in the immediate vicinity. The subject property is bound by an ingress egress easement to the west, a floodway to the east, and a section line alignment to the south on Lone Mountain Road. These features limit the buildable area for the home based on the existing parcel boundaries. Next slide, please. Staff would note that there are questions regarding the current use of the parcel. Site aerials indicate the storage of materials and vehicles on the subject site and adjacent parcels owned by the applicant that would have the potential to be used for commercial applications. Next slide, please. As seen on the, this flood map aerial, several of these materials and buildings are shown within the floodway, marked red, potentially affecting the orderly flow of water through the parcel and adjacent properties. Next slide, please. All the properties marked with an arrow are owned by the applicant or a direct family member. 
Staff would note that it would be possible in this scenario to re reconfigure these lots in such a way to mitigate setback concerns. However, there would be several issues in the permitting phase regarding existing structures within the floodway. Next slide, please. Staff is recommending denial on DA 2022-061 as the applicant has failed to demonstrate that the strict application of the Maricopa County Zoning Ordinance to the applicant's property has caused undue physical hardship that prevents the reasonable development of the property. Staff would note that along with the prior stated possibility to redelineate the lot, the applicant may also design the house to meet existing setbacks or reconfigure the ingress egress easement on the west side of the property to allow for more conducive development. However, the board finds that the applicant has proven entitlement to the variance, then the board must state on the record the basis for that determination, the findings and conclusion and a motion to grant the relief sought. And at this time, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Joel. Do we have any questions um, of staff at this time? Um, can we bring up the applicant or applicant's representative to make a presentation? Please state your name uh, for My the record. Sam okay. um, I did uh, approach uh, Mr. Landis about the materials that are on the property. Those materials are for the construction of uh, this home for my son's home, which is uh, the one at the um, northeast part of uh, where our properties are. That is my son's property. He just got his building permit recently, about two weeks ago. And uh, just yesterday, I went to the architect's office to pick up uh, floor plants for my daughter's property, which is also gonna be using uh, some of the materials on that property, none of that material has ever been for sale. I have been buying it over time at auctions or at whenever I find a good deal for the purpose of this construction. And um, as for when I originally purchased parcels, um, I did not just create the parcels myself without Maricopa County. I did um, come to Maricopa County. I asked about the process. I followed all the steps. And there is a survey and file with Maricopa County that I uh, presented to Mr. Uh, Landis. It also states that I purchased the property where my home is in 2007. And I developed, it was developed in 2008. That is incorrect. I purchased a home from the bank after they foreclosed on it from the previous owner. So I did not develop it myself. And that was purchased in 2008. Okay, do you have any other presentation you'd like to make to us at this time? Um, no, I just don't believe uh, being 11 foot close, closer to the wall is gonna affect anything adversely. I did have a grading and drainage engineer um, do what he had to do for this property in order to be able to build on it and that has been submitted um, um, we have anybody off in the audience that wishes to speak i don't have any cards you can have a seat That's, um, do you have any questions of the applicant mr Cardin? i mean you might want to go back i do apologize i'm still a rookie at this so i need to get my um, so, Mr. Cardin has a question for you. Yes. Chairman, thank you. I, I also threw you a curveball because you know I rarely ask these questions. Uh, but uh, so, thank you, uh, Mr. Odog Odogwi. I think I hope I'm saying that correctly. I uh, I'm curious if it wasn't for that floodway, would you uh, would you be doing a different plan for this house? where you would not need a variance the um what i am proposing to build is based on a um, blueprint that i had done when i was 16 years old so what i am proposing to build is exactly the purpose i had for when i purchased the property in 2005 and as far right. as the floodway, as far as the floodway, the actual area where the water flows is um, right 
into uh, the property that's east of me where that is where my home is. And um, we have never had a problem of water backing up. Um, you know, they, the entire area that it's being called a floodway, I have fruit trees there. When I purchased the property, I put in close to 200 fruit trees in that area and none of them impede the flow of water in any way, shape or form. The reason I'm asking is we have some, a statute that we are to follow as it relates to seeking a variance, which requires that we would find a peculiar condition and a hardship uh, that would necessitate you uh, seeking the variance that you're asking for. Often that relates to something on the land, such as a floodway or easements or these different things. And so my question is, recognizing you're trying to build what you want to build there, uh, if it wasn't for easements, floodway, or these different things, would you be able to accomplish what you want to accomplish without a variant? Uh, well, I am not asking to encroach into any of what's being called a floodway. I'm only asking to get be a little bit closer to the north wall. And um, at this point, I do not want to combine them prior to uh, construction because I have the ability to borrow on a single property. And if things went bad with the economy, I don't risk losing two properties. Mr. Chairman, uh, yes. can I rephrase uh, Board Member Cardin's question for the applicant? Yes. Uh, you okay with that, Mr. Cardin? Yes, thank you. Uh, Mr. Odigaway, I believe the what the board member is asking you is, is the fact that there is a floodway in the east end of your property a physical hardship that's forcing you to push your house plan further east, therefore you need a variance because you're closer east. If it wasn't for the floodway, you could build further, further east. Uh, because of the setback requirements on the west side, I am meeting the... Um, I am meeting the setbacks on the west side, so that would be exactly as planned. I, I'm sorry, I, I misstated it. I, I understand you. Are you be, because you're being pushed west, is your house being squeezed so that you got to be closer to the north setback because you can't be the, in the floodway? The purpose of having to uh, go north so much is because the Department of Transportation has a 55 foot. Um, reservation for future roadway okay so so the set the setbacks are measured from the there's an ultimate uh right away reservation on the south and that creates a street line there's a easement on the west and that creates a street line that you measure setbacks from there is a floodway to the east and the variant sought is respecting the other setback lines is to the north Do you so uh, so I have a question for you, sir. Yes. You do have the ability on the north side of your property to grab land from the other parcel you own. In not not it's not a want question, okay? It's I'm just want to ask just you do ha own the la property adjacent to and if you chose to, you could make it you could grab enough land so that you would have to eliminate getting a variance is that yeah it's a yes or a no it would be no it would be no i can't just grab a piece no you could go through a legal process by changing your map the map that allows you to get 11 or 12 more feet of other land that you currently own it would then eliminate you from having to go through this variance. You do own the land to the north, correct? I do own the land okay. to the north. Right. They are different parcels. So by Understood. taking a piece of the following parcel, if I took a piece, it would reduce it to the low one acre, which I would have to take land from my other parcel to complete that uh, that acre. So it. Um, so it how big is your parcel to the further to the north? You have two parcels to the north. So the middle parcel, if you took nine the, feet from it, it would be less than an acre. How big is the one 
to the north of that. Further to the back, it's um, right under two acres. Okay, all right, that's what I needed to know. Thank you. Have any other questions? No. I got a hand. Have you filled out a card? Yes, if you could fill out a card real quick and then we can get you up there and thank you, sir. So we're gonna open up to public testimony this time. And just uh, we'll give this um, young lady a few minutes to fill out this card. Thank you. So if you could please state your name for the record. Uh, hi there. My name is Jenny Vitali. I'm an engineer by trade and I live in Chandler, Arizona. Um, I'm sitting here in the audience watching this and I think the gentleman just doesn't understand the process for helping you understand what the hardship is. Mm -hmm. But as somebody who's been doing this for 20 some odd years, I actually see several hardships. Um, given what Darren explained as far as right of ways are concerned and that floodway and then looking at this gentleman's design, there is not an option if, if that floodway wasn't there and that wash wasn't there, then yes, this gentleman could actually take the building, move it, and he could reorient that front part that he's asking the variance for. But with that floodway there, that floodway now sets off a chain of events. The septic system has setbacks that has to be met from that wash, and that wash has a lot of flow. He's actually going to have to move his reserve area further to the west because that right now doesn't comply with the setbacks. So part of what is dictating the location of the building actually is that septic system. There is not room on the south side. And with potential right of way on the on the west side of the property, I, you can't put septic in right of way either or potential right of way. And so the septic and that floodway actually determine how far east and west all of this building can be. And so there is no way physically for him to turn that section that's encroaching 90 degrees and shove everything back. In this particular lot, the hardship is both the floodway and the septic system. And that septic system for once is actually probably to scale. Very rarely do I see an engineer actually to a GND that actually puts the septic to scale. So that, that's an accurate, accurate depiction. And so I believe your hardship is twofold. The hardship are the floodways and the easements. And then the second hardship would be having enough land to actually install the septic system per code. And so that's what's dictating that building going so far west and then having to encroach a little bit north. I hope that kind of helps everybody. Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else online that has, um, would like to speak on this item? If not, we're not aware we're... of anyone online. All right, great. So if not, we're going to close the public um, testimony. Um, so um, <clears throat> members, do you, does anybody have any questions of staff? Any comments? Any motions? Ch Chairman Schwartz? Establishing a 19 foot north setback line for APN 503-4001. Hello? Yes, do, you, do I have a second? I'm, I'm sorry, I did not hear the motion. Could it be restated? I move that we approve the variance which establishes a 19 foot north setback line for APN 503-40001W. Motion for approval, I second. Okay, we have a second. Can we have a roll call? Member Cardin? Yes. Member Schwartz? No. Member Ward? Yes. Chairman, that's an approval by a vote of two to one. Great, thank you, congratulations, sir. Good luck in building your house. All right, so let's move on to the next case, uh, BA2022, um, nope, that was the last one. <laughs> I'll get there. Too many pieces of paper. <laughs> All right, so case BA2023004, the Patalone property. Oh, I'm sorry. BA2023003, Hill property. Thank you, Chairman and members of the board. 
Case BA 2023-003 is for the Hill property in Supervisor District 3. The site is located at 43848 North 10th Street in the New River area in the Rural 43 Zoning District. Next slide, please. The request includes the following. Proposed hillside disturbance of 3,447 square feet and location of septic outside of the last principal building envelope where no disturbance is allowed. Next slide, please. Granting of the variance would allow the issuance of an active building permit for a single family residence. The subject property is entirely defined hillside with slopes of at least 15% over the property, but is severely encumbered by extreme slopes in excess of 40% on the southwestern portion of the property, prohibiting placement of the septic within the principal building envelope. Next slide, please. Staff notes the applicant proposed the establishment of a preservation area within the principal building envelope as a trade-off for the proposed disturbance. While staff recognizes the passes of this proposal, it must be noted that the board does not have authority to establish such a preservation area. Staff has received one email of opposition on the proposal. Next slide, please. The applicant has determined that there is a peculiar condition facing the property because of the unusually severe slopes encumbering safe development within the lots principal building envelope. The applicant has demonstrated applying the requirements of the MCZO to this property that has these peculiar conditions and undue physical hardship exists because the extreme slopes prohibit placement of a properly functioning septic system within the principal building envelope. The staff offers the board the following to memorial memorialize approval. Variance approval establishes 3,447 square feet of hillside disturbance for well and septic systems to be located outside of the principal building envelope on APN 202-20461-G. At this time, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for the presentation. Do we have any questions of staff? If not, I'd like to call the applicant or um, the representative to uh, speak. Thank you. If you could please just state your name again for the record. Uh, my name is Jenny Vitali. I am the engineer of record for this project. Uh, this one tested me. I haven't had to do a hard one like this in a long time. Once you get above 20, 25% on the slope, it becomes a very tricky beast uh, finding that sweet spot with the finished floor. You're either chasing the grade downhill or you're chasing that cut back uphill. And so uh, just about the time I would think I'd had it nailed down, um, I would be extending beyond the BSL to the north or to the south with my retaining walls and my cut and fills. But I finally did get the driveway orientation nailed down and I finally did get that finished floor. We just have a little bit of driveway uh, encroachment in, outside the BSL that allows me to put retaining walls and make a safe driveway. Up there, you cannot back down a driveway. You have to be able to get turned around and get back down, whether you're the owner or an emergency vehicle or what have you. Um, there has to be the ability to safely turn around up there. So what that left me with was not a whole lot with respect to the septic. Um, I've been, I think it's been about 10 years since I've been before the board with a variance for the septic. Uh, I try and follow the hillside regs as best I can, but unfortunately, when they redid the hillside regs during the recession, uh, how we were going to put working septic systems within that BSL on these tricky lots wasn't really taken into consideration. And so my job as an engineer uh, on these tricky lots is to do my best to comply with the hillside ordinance, but I also have a responsibility with respect to the septic system to put a system out there that's going to function and is going to function beyond the 20 year design life that I'm required to design it for. Why? How the heck are you gonna get equipment back up there once that house is built and those retaining walls are up to replace a tank, replace a drip field? So my, my job is to put a system in that's gonna live well beyond how long I live, 50, 60, 70 years. Because it's funny how fast 20 years go by. My, my second septic alternative I ever did is literally just down the street from this and 20 years goes by and here we are again with another alternative. So that's the reason for that. With respect to the preservation easement, when we first were playing with these new hillside regulations after the recession, that was actually one of the trade-offs Darren and I came up with was how do you, 
how do you maybe do a swap where if we get permission to go outside the BSL with the septic, we're going to actually try and preserve something inside the BSL that is more environmentally sensitive. And in this case, that's where that preservation easement is. This is Pyramid Peak. And so if you're familiar with Circle Mountain Road, um, it gets very steep towards the top. And so what we're proposing to preserve is the rock upcroppings and the rhyolite tuff that's coming through the surface that we wouldn't even be able to get a septic on anyway. So that's kind of the, the nexus of how this design came about. Um, the other good thing about this lot is she's the first one in. And so I am hum hamstrung by surrounding properties that are vacant, but this lot will be sharing a well with the lot to the north and the lot to the west, which actually helps those guys out on their development too and gives them more options for keeping their septic in the BSL and, and just putting a, a better design together. But I did my best to keep her tight. It's a modest house. This is not a McMansion. This is, I think, a very modest uh, house for up there. It's only a couple of, what, 2,000, 3,000 square feet with garage. We are not doing a big backyard, as you can see. Um, they've got a courtyard instead for their puppy dog run. And I think the biggest encroachment is, with respect to the driveway, is just getting that turnaround area up top so that someone could safely go into the garage and then back up and then drive forward down the driveway. Thank you. Do we have any questions of the applicant? Yes. Chairman Schwartz. Yes, I think we have Fern here first, and then we'll jump over to you, Mr. Carden. I can't. I'm looking for where I highlighted it. Um, so if one of the others had developed first, they would have the well. The yeah, the way this lot, this was a parent parcel and they split it into three lots and they did one well easement uh, that's actually on this drawing um, for those three lots. And so, yes, if somebody else were to have built first, then they would have the responsibility of putting the well, but they would have the responsibility of putting the well in the well easement, which is on this lot and, and shares part of it with okay. the lot to the north. Commissioner Cardin, sorry. Thank you, Chairman Schwartz. Uh, Ms. Batali, thank you. Great presentation. I, uh, I just, is it too extreme to say that without this easement, this property could not be developed? Correct. I would have no, no way to put the septic in. When you do a hundred foot arc around the, the well, that basically tickles the edge of the tanks and, and it comes through the building. So there's no way for me to put the septic in front of the house. There's also a goofy 30-foot roadway easement in front of the house that splits off a of 10th Street, and that was done 30 years ago. Um, some ba somebody basically took a Jeep trail and ran it to the top of the saddle. And so um, in keeping with that road, they made an easement around it. But yeah, I have no way to put the septic inside the BSL behind the house. I have a 20-foot setback to any cut slope, and that's the top of the cut slope with respect to septic. And once it gets too steep, it's too rocky. There's no soil for me to even put the geoflow drip tubing into in that area. So um, I would have what is called daylighting and a failed septic system. Thank you. Um, I have a quick question. Is it a single level house yes. all on one, all at the same ele elevation? Yes. So if you stepped the house, would it have helped you at all? Stepped it down the hill? No, it probably your... would have made it worse because then I'm going to have, uh, I'm now I'm, I'm, I've got to chase the, the cut back up the hill. So no, this was just, I mean, this is the minimum height a house can be. And it was an absolute booger uh, to, to get this to snug in. Um, as it is, I've got six foot retaining walls on the bottom. I've got a four foot step wall on the top. So I've got 10 foot combination of wall on the downslope side. I've got six foot wall with another 15 feet of cut on the upslope side. Once you start breaking that up, um, now that makes the driveway get shoved even further out. And I can't, there's a limit to how far I can shove the driveway out because I've got that 30 foot ingress egress along the east property line. Great. Thank you for the explanation. Any more questions? All right. Thank you. Um, so now I want to open up to public comment um, or testimony. Is there anybody in the audience or online that would like to speak on this matter? Um, being none, I'm going to close uh, public testimony. Um, so um, leave it up to um, the board if they have any further questions of staff or they'd like to make a motion. Uh, Commissioner Cardin. 
Chairman Schwartz, thank you. I, uh, I'll note that there was a letter of opposition to this and the next case. I'll also note that uh, uh, that I was interested in this one part. They said the applicant also states the lot would be unbuildable if the variance were denied because of the various setbacks and location requirements. While this may be true, so that's kind of got to the question I was asking. Uh, I guess I don't feel the same as this letter of opposition that, you know, a, a lot ought to be be able to be buildable in some respect. Uh, and I think that Ms. Vitali did a great job in, the, in this presentation. So I would move to approve BA 2023-003. Do I have a second? second? We have a second. Can we have a roll call? Member Cardin? Yes. Member Ward? Yes. Cameron Schwartz? Yes. Everyone Good luck to you. Approval by a vote of three to zero. Good luck in building your house. Thank you. So let's move on um, to case BA 2023-004, the Petaloni property. Uh, Chairman Schwartz and members of the board, agenda item number four is for subject case BA 2023-004, which is a variance request for an RU43 zone property. Uh, located 43827 North 11th Avenue in the New River area in Supervisor District 3. For in the staff report, proving this request would have the effect of allowing for a 1,218 square feet of existing and new hillside disturbance outside of the lot's principal building envelope where no disturbance is allowed uh, to develop a new garage. Next slide, please. Uh, the subject lot was developed in the early 2000s and is subject to both hillside and wash conditions throughout the lot. The applicant indicates that at the time of development under a prior owner, that hillside regulations at that time allowed for disturbance outside a buildable envelope. The garage itself is not within the hillside area. However, the disturbance caused by its construction extends 240 square feet outside the buildable envelope. Staff would note that the applicant has taken several steps to allow for more conducive construction on the lot, including the abandoning of an easement along the north parcel line. Staff would note that per site aerials and the provided narrative, the current owners already caused some hillside disturbance outside the buildable envelope and not in the location of the proposed garage. Uh, while staff cannot condition to this, uh, according to the applicant, these areas would be revegetated and historical drainage patterns would be reestablished as part of the development process. Next slide, please. Staff is recommending approval on BA 2023-004 for the following reasons. The applicant has demonstrated that there is a peculiar condition facing the property in that there are scattered areas of hillside disturbance interspersed with difficult drainage patterns created by the lot's rough topography, pre-existing disturbance, and existing washes. The applicant has demonstrated applying the requirements of the Maricopa County Zoning Ordinance to this property has this, that has this peculiar condition that ha an undue physical hardship exists that prevents reasonable development of the property in that the applicant is trying to focus development on areas of pre-existing disturbance and thus maintain the majority of hillside areas in the natural state. And finally, the applicant has demonstrated that the general intent and purpose of the Maricopa County Zoning Ordinance will be preserved despite the variance because as the structure itself is not located within the hillside area of the lot, and disturbance in the hillside areas is minimal, greatly minimizing the impact of the proposed construction. However, if the board finds that any aspect of the statutory test has not been proven, the board must state on the record the basis for that determination in a motion to deny the relief sought. And at this time, I am happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you very much. Do we have any questions of staff? All right, great. If we can have the applicant or applicant's representative come up and state your name for the record, even though you've done it a couple of times now. Uh, my name is Jenny Vitali. I am the engineer of record for this project. I reside in Chandler, Arizona. So it's amazing. I, I did the original grading and drainage plan for this back in 2002 or 2003. Um, and I was very green back then, but I figured it out. Uh, but back then we were dealing with a different hillside ordinance. Back then it was 15% of 15%. If you remember that, you can only disturb 15% of anything that was hillside. And back then the couple that owned this property um, wanted to place the house such that the lot could never be split. Uh, they wanted to make sure that uh, that desert got preserved. And so I had the challenge of placing this house to accomplish that goal, uh, but also uh, balancing the dirt. The original grading and drainage plan did not include uh, a wraparound driveway. That was actually kind of done during construction with, by the construction guys, and they just kept it. If you look at that lot, there's actually two main areas where the water wants to drain. And 
on the south side of the lot, if you follow the tree line, that is a topographical ravine that uh, should never be disturbed. It is where the water wants to go. And you can see we did a brow ditch up top originally to force the water coming through that property to that wash where it should be. With respect to the north side, you can't tell on this because they uh, went and did some clearing and grubbing so they could motorcycle on property, but um, the water actually wants to come through where you see a color change on the driveway up there, uh, the water wants to come through the top of that color change and then on the north side of the house and then continue its way uh, towards Skunk Creek. The tricky part for me now is as an engineer, how do I marry the old hillside rags with the new hillside rags, right? Back then you could disturb outside the building setback line, you could go hog wild so long as it was 15% or 15%, but now we're hamstrung to development within there. So. I am stuck with the placement of this house. The entire backyard is either the septic system or the reserve area. And so um, it's not available to me for placement of a building. The next thought was, okay, well, what are you using this building for? It's a detached garage, right? You've got, so the gentleman has motorcycles, the gentleman has RVs, and if you're gonna do a detached garage and you're gonna be placing RVs in there, you can't bottom out. And so you have to put your building such that you can set your finished floor to marry with the existing driveway such that you don't bottom out your equipment trying to get in and out. I was able to convince him, he wanted the, the placement of the building further back. Um, he wanted it more kind of everything middle lined up and I told him, no, that's never gonna happen. So I convinced him to shove the building further to the west. That allowed me to marry the finished floor better with the existing driveway. And it also got the building pretty much out of the hillside. You can see from that line, um, and because I did the original G&D and because I still have my computer from 98, don't ask me why, and yes, I can still pull files off of that, um, I had the original topo. So I was able to properly delineate the hillside line. And as you can see, it gets a little squirrely on that side and does some zigzags. It's not just a nice clean 15% straight across the way. So a little corner of the building encroaches, but it is within the BSL. My conundrum was, what the heck do I do on the east side of the building? I do have a retaining wall up along the north prop line. There is no way for me to do some weird random configuration with a wall um, on the east side of the building. I can't follow that 15% line and do a retaining wall because I would still have to do stacked retaining walls. There's too much grade change in that area for me to just plunk one wall down. Um, and so even if I were doing stepped walls, I would still be coming in for a variance because I would still have to extend that wall into the BSL to properly retain that little corner chunk up there uh, that extends into the BSL. I did have him abandon the 20 foot ingress egress that ran across the top. Back in the day when the former property owner had this lot, he had the lot to the north, he had the lot to the east. And at that time, they weren't sure how the roads were gonna lay out. So he just ran an easement just so he could not landlock himself. He could have access to the other properties. By removing that easement, it actually then uh, preserves now that, that hillside because if it, was, if it stayed an easement, they could technically go in there and cut a road. There's nothing that prevents them from doing that. They're still within the hillside regulations to do that. So um, by abandoning the easement, it preserves hillside. It allows me to keep 95% of my building in non-hillside slopes. And it only encroaches on the fill slope about 240, 250 square feet. Um, that entire yellow area is not being requested for the variance. That is just showing you um, fill slope in the hillside. And it's just a little chunk up top, a little top hat, so to speak, that I need the variance for because I can't, I can't get the walls to work. Uh, no matter what, I'm asking for a variance. I'm either asking for a variance for a wall or I'm asking for a variance for a fill slope. And the fill slope is cleaner and it allows me to revegetate. Um, and this gentleman actually has already started plucking cactus out um, and setting them aside so that he can replant them. Um, I encourage him to do that. So um, I guess that's about it. And then the other thing this does is that that driveway, the little motorcycle track that he made down there, that goes bye bye because by placing the building here and placing the fill slope and the retaining wall on the south side of the building, um, it leaves me a gap where the water wants to naturally go and it effectively cuts him off from being able to motorcycle on the property because now that becomes the wash. So that will naturally revegetate itself and, and brittle bush back. And it takes, with these rainy seasons, it only take about three to five years. If you look at the historical photos from the septic, uh, the septic basically tore apart the whole backyard and here we are 20 years later with a, a nicely vegetated backyard. Do we have any questions of the applicant? 
I do not. Thank you. Commissioner Cardin. I just want to say thank you for giving us a detailed explanation because I have had to build a lot of homes and develop a lot of properties in the hillside and you have to be very sensitive um, and creative to try to find solutions rather than just plopping I just want to plop a house here wherever I want to cut there's it's 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 tricky working with slopes it's tricky and I know there's the same gentleman opposed this variance as well um, I'm I'm somebody who loves the desert. I actually started a program two years ago with Tonto National Forest and any of my clients who are developing, if they don't want their small cactus, they actually donate them through my program to Tonto National Forest and in the last two years we've back up back in the Burnstar area. So um, I'm very big into preservation. I want it, it, I make my living off of development, but at the same time, I do my darndest to make sure that when I develop lots, we're making the smallest footprint and I'm encouraging people to either salvage their cactus or donate them. Um, so um, I'm going to open this up to public testimony and before I do that I just I say thank you for coming Wayne I was missing you there for a minute so thank you um, um, so let's open this up for public uh, testimony or comment do we have anybody in live here or anybody online that would like to speak Okay, I guess not. Duly noted, though, that there was a person in opposition to this case. He did uh, the same thing on the previous case, so it's been duly noted. Um, so with that, I'm going to close public testimony and um, turn this over to um, my fellow commissioners to um, make a motion or comments. I see uh, Commissioner Cardin with his hand up. Thank you, Chairman Schwartz. Yes, I move to approve BA 2023-004. Do I have a second? Second. Can I get a roll call, please? Member Cardin. Yes. Chairman Schwartz. Yes. Member Ward. Yes. Chairman, that's an approval by a vote of three to zero. Great. Thank you. Good luck in building both houses. All right. Can we get a um, move on to case TU 2023-003, the Hogan property? Chairman Schwartz, members of the board, agenda item number five is for subject case TU 2023-003, which is a temporary use permit for underage occupancy request for an R4 senior citizen overlay zone property, subject to violation case V 2022-02538, uh, located at 10724 West Peoria Avenue in the Sun City area in Supervisory District 4. As written in the staff report, approving this request would have the effect for allowing for an underage occupant to reside within the senior citizen overlay for a period not to exceed March 18th, 2024. Next slide, please. The applicant is requesting this temporary use permit on behalf of her son, whom she adopted in 2014. It is understood based on the documentation provided to the county that the underage occupant is unable to live independently and will require a permanent caretaker due to his conditions. As of today's date, the underage occupant is 17 years old and will be turning 18 next month. Therefore, the permit re request only extends to March of 2024, which is when the applicant turns 19 and will be allowed to within the community by right as long as the home is occupied by somebody not less than 55 years old. Next slide, please. Staff would note that while the county does not take a role in enforcing the CCNRs of any community located within the senior citizen overlay, the applicant is in full compliance with the CCNRs of her condo association. This is because prior to purchasing the home on August 13th of 2021, the applicant applied for and received a variance from the condo association, MFG Apartments, on July 31st of 2021 to allow for the underage occupant to live at the condo. Uh, this was stated incorrectly in the published staff report, so I do want to emphasize that the applicant bought the home on August 13th after receiving the variance and not prior on July 1st as written. Additionally, as Sun City's HOA uh, covers only covers single family dwellings and not condos, unlike in prior cases, Sun City's HOA did not provide formal comments. Staff would like to emphasize what is emphasize what is before the board today is just a temporary use permit application and not a determination regarding Sun City's overlay. As with prior applications within the overlay, staff has received many letters in opposition to the proposed request. In some, staff received 88 letters of opposition in addition to nine letters of support. Staff would note that since 2009, there have only been six temporary use permit requests, including a subject case of which two have been approved. As staff and members of the board can attest to, this and the prior cases that have come before the board have involved very difficult sets of circumstances. Staff is recommending approval on TU 2023-003. 
This request to allow for 13 months of underage occupancy is of short duration and will have no foreseeable significant impact on the senior citizens community. Staff notes the property owner received approval for underage occupancy from her condos, condominium association. However, the board finds that the temporary use per, uh, permit is not warranted. The board must state on the record the basis for that determination and a motion to deny the relief sought. And at this time, I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Do we have any questions of staff? Commissioner Ward? I have one question. Um, um, Joel and Darren, did the Master Association opine in at all about the temporary use permit? Yes, Mr. Chairman, and and I uh, I think I uh, I don't know if we can say this in staff report, but they maintain a website where they comment on cases, so they did not provide us with a formal comment, but on their website they commented that the uh, that they defer to the condominium associations outside the single family residential neighborhoods, so they mentioned that the condominium association is signed off, and that soup and that they defer to them. Great, thank you for that. Uh, for that, um, okay. So at this time, do we have an applicant here to um, speak on behalf of the case? Oh, they're online. So great, if you could state your name for the record. David, it's Rachel. If you can unmute the mic for Rebecca Sobe. Okay. Hi. Good morning. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Because um, I understand the applicant is here as well. So I wasn't sure who you wanted to speak first. But yes. So thank you. Good morning. This is Rebecca Sobe. Um, I'm a staff attorney with the Arizona Center for Disability Law. Um, so ACDL is the federally mandated. Wait, excuse, and Excuse me for one second. Can, are you making the presentation on behalf of the applicant or is the applicant be making a presentation? So there is, oh, the applicant is here as well. I am here appearing, appearing on behalf of the underage occupant. So I'm not, do you want, would you prefer for the applicant for Ms. Hogan to speak first? No, no, that's fine. I just wanted just to clarify for the record so that I make sure that I, not just I understood, but the, um, the, the public understands uh, everybody's role. So thank you. If you could please start at the top again, um, I apologize. Sure, no problem. Um, so yeah, so good morning, everyone. I am Rebecca Sobe. I'm a staff attorney with the Arizona Center for Disability Law. We are the federally mandated and designated protection and advocacy system for persons with disabilities in the state of Arizona. And as indicated, I'm here today appearing on behalf of the underage occupant. Um, ACDL submitted an advocacy letter yesterday outlining our position on behalf of our client. We cited um, extensive legal and statutory authority supporting issuance of the temporary use permit, um, as well as reformation of this process as it relates to reasonable accommodation requests for people with disabilities. Um, so I'm incorporating that letter by reference, and today I'll present a brief synopsis of the points raised in the letter um, regarding the application. So the letter also addresses systemic concerns that I will not focus on today, um, but we do anticipate discussing those issues with the county's attorneys. Um, and so based on the legal authority cited in our letter, it's respectfully submitted that the temporary use permit be approved as a reasonable accommodation for Ms. Hogan's son due to his disabilities. Um, so voting in favor of the application would be consistent with fair housing and the ADA laws. A voting against the application would um, violate the fair housing and ADA laws for the reasons set forth in our letter. So just to briefly go over the facts, and I won't repeat um, what Mr. Landis had just presented, um, but prior to purchasing the condo, Ms. Hogan should have been informed of the process to request reasonable accommodation through the county. And I understand that the board doesn't make these uh, decisions right now. Um, so we won't review all of the details on that 
issue um, other than to say that she was not informed and she was not aware of the alleged requirement um, to go through this process until late December 2022. That was after she received notice from the county of a zoning ordinance violation. Um, she then contacted the planning department, informed them that she had permission for her son to reside with her as an accommodation for his disability. Um, then Ms. Hogan provided documentation to the county supporting the disability and the need to live with her. Um, but this process still proceeded. So we're hoping that there's could be reformation um, as to this process. Um, she was also told by the county to apply for the temporary use permit at a cost of $595, which she incurred. She shouldn't have been charged this surcharge for the reasonable accommodation request. I'm not sure if reimbursement of this surcharge is within the purview of the board, but if it is, we would ask that you also um, make a determination um, on that. Um, and so in late January, the county then posted a notice of the application in Ms. Hogan's front yard. Um, that included publishing personal and confidential information um, about Ms. Hogan and her son. That triggered an outpouring of misplaced scrutiny and personal attacks um, on Ms. Hogan that led to extreme trauma for her and her minor son. Um, and so really, I, I read over the opposing comments, at least the ones that were in Mr. Landis's report. Um, the matter is not about an age restriction. The majority of the comments refer to the 2080 overlay. Um, that is not even in play or applicable here. Um, because according to the ordinance, Ms. Hogan already meets the 55 plus requirement per household. So there is no impact on the overlay to allow her son to reside with her. Um, this is really, it's about a reasonable accommodation for a disability. That's a legal right under state and federal fair housing laws, um, as well as Title II of the ADA. Um, there's also concern cited in the opposition that it's opening the doors to an influx of underage occupants um, that is similarly misplaced. Uh, reasonable accommodation considerations require a fact-intensive analysis. Um, the Kennedy case, um, which is the Arizona Court of Appeals case, um, debunks all of the opposition um, comments in this case as well, um, because again, they're they're not relevant to the uh, matters at issue. Um, and so the, the zoning ordinance at issue violates fair housing laws to the extent that it discriminates against people with disabilities, um, absent granting reasonable accommodation. Um, the county has an affirmative duty to reasonably accommodate citizens with disabilities, and that includes making changes to zoning ordinances, regulations, and practices. Again, we realize that that is not within the purview of the board. Um, that's something that we hope to address and discuss with the county attorneys in terms of reforming this process for the future. Um, and lastly, as mentioned, as highlighted in the letter, um, the Kennedy case protects um, a decision, a vote in favor here. Um, the Arizona Court of Appeals there held that a homeowners association violated the reasonable accommodation mandate under the federal and state fair housing laws. Um, and that was very similar scenario here um, for failing to waive the community's minimum age requirement um, to allow an underage occupant with disabilities to reside with his parents. So um, thank you for your time today. We welcome any uh, questions regarding this matter. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Cardin, Commissioner Ward, do you have any questions of applicant? No, not of the applicant. Chair, Chairman Schwartz, just a comment of thank you for that informative presentation. I do have one. I have a question. I'm not sure if it's who it's to. But many times, several times we've heard on these cases about the 20%. Um, how many how many people would that be? 
Approximately, because we've had six applicants. I'm guessing 20% would be in the hundreds. Mr. Mr. Ch uh, Chairman, Member Ward, uh, I believe it'd be closer to 2,000. Okay, that was, thank yeah, you. It's, it, it's, it's not an issue and it has never come close to being an issue. Okay, okay thank, thank you. you very much for that. Do we have any comments from staff? Yep, yes. Um, so, um, Wayne, if you could come over and speak your name for the record. <laughs> Peck, I'm here to, I just want to explain to the board why this is different than the other cases we've heard so the board understands because it's part of my job to give you people advice and guidance. The, the two cases I remember, one was the request was related to a custody dispute where the, uh, the parents were fighting over custody and the child was underage. The other one was the occupant of the unit who was over 55, had a disability and was hiring a caretaker who had an underage child. So it was not really something where the disability was involved with the age restriction directly. This case is very different. The application is to allow an individual who has the disability to reside. That's why Ms. Sobey is 100% correct. It brings into question the issues under the Fair Housing Act and uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act. Ms. Sobey's letter as to the three issues that have traditionally been raised in opposition, she's 100% correct. I read the case she cited to us. Those were the exact same points made. And the Court of Appeals said those were not a basis to deny an accommodation for the disability. There may be others, but we haven't heard those. Ms. Sobey also, we communicated. She has explained to us why she believes that our ordinance itself is problematic. I will represent to you that I have had conversations in the past with staff and management at the department, and we are looking into that. We've invited Ms. Sobey to help us as we do that. She has agreed, but I just want you to understand this temporary use permit does fall squarely within the federal definition of a reasonable accommodation. So if you believe this accommodation to be reasonable, I would hope that would help guide you when you make your decision, but it is different than the other cases we've heard. Thank you. Um, so um, with that, do we have, I know we have a lot of people uh, against this case that we've got notification from and a few um, um, that are for it. So do we have um, public, uh, any public testimony regarding this? Uh, Chairman, we have uh, Cheryl Hogan, who is a property owner. She's registered that would like to speak. Okay. I apologize, David Mike's uh, not working. Okay. So go ahead, Ms. Hogan. Just state your name for the record. Ms. Hogan, we do see that you have three links in GoToWebinar. You'll need to unmute on your side. Hello? Hello? Hello, we can hear you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I apologize. I was kind of confused. Um, so, hello, my name is Cheryl Hogan, and I'm the applicant for the temporary use permit. And I'd first like to thank Rebecca Sobey for being here today to represent my son. I'm grateful to her from the bottom of my heart. I'd also like to thank those of you who have displayed understanding, compassion, and support for us. I can't tell you how much we appreciate it. My son is in school. He is aware that a decision will be made today regarding approval for him to live in our home with me. I asked him if there was anything he'd like me to say for him, and he said, just ask them to please let me live with my mom. To the Board of Adjustment, I would like to say that my intent on moving to Sun City was never to deceive anyone. I've been 
an open book from the beginning of this journey. I found myself in very reduced circumstances and in the process of trying to secure my son's and my financial future, I found here in Sun City a community that I thought would be affordable and who would understand our unique situation. I felt that based on my son's disabilities, our situation was a compelling case for extenuating circumstances to apply for a variance for my son to live with me. Because of that and the fact that at age 66, I was eligible for and in need of the affordable cost of living here, I began the process of buying my condo. I also understood that my son's disabilities offered him the opportunity under fair housing disability laws to live here with me as his caretaker. Knowing those things, I made the offer to buy my condominium. And once it was accepted, I applied for a variance with my condo association for my disabled son to live with me. I closed on my condo only after I received the requested approval from my condo association. In we lost you. You know, some technical difficulties. David, can you recheck the link for Ms. Hogan? We lost audio. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Oh, okay. I just have one final paragraph. Um, in closing, I would like to say that I was astonished at the vitriol directed at me and by association, my son in this community. I have been called deceitful, slimy, liar, despicable, sneaky, etc., by mean, misinformed, and uninformed people. This has caused both of us so much fear, hurt, stress, and heartache. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hogan. Um, so, is, do we have anybody else online um, that would like to speak? Yes, Chairman, we have one more that would like to speak in support. The name is Nancy Rowe. David, if you can unmute her mic. Are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, if you could state your name um, for the record, please. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Nancy Rowe, and I'm Cheryl Hogan's sister and Warren Hogan's aunt. Thank you for the opportunity to speak about this very important issue. It is very unfortunate that this hearing is even taking place. Regardless of how tempting it is, I will not take this time to address the horrific situation that some very ill-informed and unscrupulous individuals who issued this complaint have put my sister and autistic nephew through or address the illegalities related to the Americans with Disabilities Act. I will instead offer my insights into what my sister Cheryl has done to provide my nephew with a safe and secure home since she became a foster parent to Warren and subsequent adoption on August 7th, 2014. When Warren came into her life and our family's life several years ago, Warren was a petrified, guarded, and practically nonverbal little boy who had grown up in hotels with drug addicted parents. He had been abused in every way imaginable and had no sense of security whatsoever. Cheryl's heart went out to him and she spent months with him as he came into her office at the school he attended and he very gradually began to even look up at her and make eye contact. He was a completely lost little boy who had no understanding of the life he had lived or the world around him. Cheryl's connection with him and her truly empathetic nature drew her to the decision to be his foster parent. She went through everything she needed to become a foster parent or his foster parent. She completely fell in love with this little boy as we all did and decided she wanted to be his permanent parent. She wanted him to know he would always have a safe home and never again endure the horrors he had been through in his life. Her primary concern was to give him a loving and safe home. Having watched her parent him and see him blossom into the wonderful young man he is today has been nothing short of amazing. He is kind, generous, loving, funny, and a wonderful addition to our family. 
Cheryl made the decision to move to Arizona because she could not afford the housing in Colorado. The only thing she could afford in Arizona was a senior living community and went through every approval she needed to have Warren live with her at this community that she knew of. She did not purchase this home until she had received the necessary approval. I cannot express how difficult it has been to hear what she has been through over the past couple of months and the appalling comments that have been said about her by these people who do not know her at all. For Cheryl to even have to worry about Warren's safety and security after all these years by these people is utterly outrageous. Not only do I hope this board votes in favor of Cheryl, I sincerely hope this board takes action to ensure this type of situation never happens to anyone again. I pray that these individuals will never be able to put anyone through something as despicable as this again. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we have no other public comment at this time. So we're going to close the public testimony. Um, so do any of the board members have questions of staff or the applicant? Uh, comments, questions, any motions? Comment or a motion or? Motion. Motion. <laughs> um, okay, I have one, I have one comment if we could before the motion okay um so as everybody knows i've been kind of a tickler or a stickler on process and procedures going through the right steps asking for permission not for forgiveness and so i just want to thank the applicant and the applicant's attorney for working with the association not just her sub association but the general association out at sun city i have been you know very i think vocal about you know, trying to work together to find common ground with people in, in different situations. So I'm glad that you did go through that. I commend you and applaud you for it and working with Wayne. And hopefully we can clean up some of the things um, within our um, within our zoning regulations. You know, we're always trying to make ourselves better here and just out in the world and helping one another. So, so thank you very much. So with that, I will entertain a motion who was going to raise their hand first. Um, <laughs> And knew that Ms. Hogan did her due diligence prior to moving in. And with that, I would like to. I don't for her son to with the temporary use permit until he turns 19, at which time he won't. So, do I have a second? Chairman Schwartz, I didn't hear the motion, but if it is a motion for approval, then I second that motion. Okay, is there anything special in the motion other than what was read? Okay, so um, so we have, a, we have a motion and a second by Member Cardin. Um, if we can get a roll call, please. Member Cardin. Yes. Member Ward. Yes. Chairman Schwartz. Uh, yes. Um, Chairman, that's an approval by a vote of three to zero. So, Ms. Hogan, um, congratulations. God bless you. Um, and go to run to school and tell your son that he can live with his mom. Um, so, um, thank you all today. I have one more question. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, I know you said it was not under our purview regarding the $595 surcharge. Is there any place they can go to have? Sorry. That's already being reviewed in internally. Okay. okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, we stand adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Chairman Schwartz. You did great. Thanks. Bye. Bye.